Welcome to Not Going Quietly, the podcast where we inspire growth, beat down biases, and get into all sorts of good trouble with co-hosts Jonathan Beale and Britt East. No topic is off limits as we explore ways to help everyone leap into life with a greater sense of clarity, passion, purpose, and joy. So get ready to join us for some courageous conversation because Not Going Quietly starts right now. Hey everyone, welcome to Not Going Quietly, the podcast for outraged optimists and heartbroken healers all over the world, where we have the conversations that nobody else wants to. I'm your host, Britt East, with my wonderful co-host, Jonathan Beal, and today we're going to talk about knowing your intrinsic value. Jonathan, what in the heck does that even mean? What is my intrinsic value? That's a really great question, and I will do my very best to answer it. Um, the best way to put it is my, my view, my opinion is such that, um, as individuals, we, we hold value regardless of, uh, what we might produce or what we might do for others. We are inherently of value and, and that's been skewed a little bit over the years, uh, and societally. And I really want us to reclaim that, right? Because us existing as a, as a, as a life form is value enough. And if you look at nature, all animals, all life forms have value, not because of what they produce, just because of being a part of the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? What's it called? <laughs> the ecosystem, what's, maybe? The ecosystem, that'll do. <laughs> Yes. And while that may sound really lovely and um, perhaps a little bit, um, a little bit uh, rainbows and unicorns, because <laughs> um, <laughs> it does, right? Not going to lie. Um, I, I believe there's truth in there and, and that we get to embrace that. Well, OK, I'm an American, so I have questions. <laughs> yes. If we all have intrinsic value, then how will we know who's winning? <laughs> okay. I mean, <laughs> why does anyone have to win? <laughs> <laughs> well, if we don't know who's winning, then how will we know how much we should be getting paid? Ah, uh, okay. Right. So capitalism. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So an exchange of value for money. Right. So that, that assumes that without value, we don't deserve life or existence. Yeah. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah. And you know, I mean, I guess one of the things that I suspect a lot of folks watching this might struggle with or, or might question out of the gate is, um, is um, you know, is central to fairness some degree of personal responsibility? And if so, do we need to collectively incent people to take responsibility? or do they have that drive in themselves intrinsically? And even if they do have that drive, does it need to be stoked to bring out the best in them so they can win and make money? Well, so <laughs> win and make money. Great. Thanks for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's the interesting thing, right? We got to where we are today as human beings, because somewhere along the line, we began having intrinsic value in tribal systems, right? We provided for each other. We learnt how to operate in a world that was a damn scary place and that wanted to kill us. And we did that without a wage. We did that purely because we figured out that every member of the tribe had some value and something to bring to the table. And everyone got fed, everyone got looked after, and everyone was able to exist um, fairly free of having a boss. <laughs> I was trying to think of something else to say, but that 
And and so as organisms, I believe it is the systems and societal norms slash expectations that lead to complacency, not our inherent desire to do nothing. Yeah, so, I mean, let me give some caveats and back up. Obviously, Jonathan and I are not anthropologists or social scientists. <laughs> We're just kind of having a coffee clutch here in, in, in the thought experiment. Um, so it sounds like there's a certain degree of um, um, in indigenous societies, there was a certain degree of equity baked into the cake based on their their role with their environment. And through the Industrial Revolution, the advent of various technological leaps, that role with the environment, their, their role with their environment changed somewhat, which irrevocably altered the way they treated each other. And then that was further distorted, perverted, and magnified with colonialism. Did that, is that too big of a leap? No, that sounds like a pretty accurate description to me. <laughs> and capitalism started in England in like the 16th century, something like that, I think. I'm not a historian, but I think that's when it started. And then, of course, it, and it seems like um, quickly thereafter, England had to push out throughout the world to find new markets and new resources to market, um, which also kind of accelerated the colonization of the planet. So I yes. think it's all Jonathan's fault. Perhaps. Because <laughs> you're the British guy, so. Well, yeah. I mean, according to my 23andMe profile, perhaps not. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> but <clears throat> I'll take that, right? I, I, am not, I am not above accepting the... Um, the the actions and faults of my ancestors and 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 paying back for that right <laughs> and to your point you can't get rich if you don't have more customers you can't get rich if you don't have more resources and so you know capitalist capitalism can only exist in a world where um where someone wants more resources and uh, more money, whatever you want to call it, and more people to exploit in the process, right? And I think you could even say winners and losers. Capitalism is based on you a zero-sum game of winners and losers, which gets yes. back to my original point. How do I know if I'm winning? Well, you're winning if you're the Jeff Bezos of this world, right? Exactly. If, if, what you've, if what you've managed to do is exploit so many people that your bank balance is now so huge that it would take you many thousands of lifetimes to spend it, um, while the people that you employ are suffering and unable to meet rent, unable to put food on their table, and unable to live freely in this world. That's how you know you're winning. <laughs> So how do we um, how do we resist that? Like I know there's concepts of like um, universal basic income and things like that. Uh, how can we resist the relentless drive of capitalism to to further polarize winners and losers and create almost a second gilded age that we're living in? Well, I mean, I think it starts with shifting attitudes, right? I think it's it's very difficult to break out of a system that we feel proud of. And, you know, working in the industry that I have done for for, for a long time, a hustle culture as, as one thing, and, you know, working yourself into a, an early grave for the sake of a few extra pounds or dollars is is lauded as this magical thing that you must do in order to um to exist in the system that that we have and it's it's almost a trophy right and so and unless that attitude changes unless we um are willing to demand something different and see it for what it is which is which is pure exploitation right governments are doing it businesses are doing it, governments in particular are doing it in such a way um, that made me lose my train of thought. So maybe I'll come back to it in a second. <laughs> well, you got me thinking, you got me thinking that like, 
it almost sounds like conversations around reparations. So yeah. one um, conversation we're having in the U.S. now about race is um, should we and how would we um, create a system of reparations to in some way acknowledge or atone for the genocide um, of the indigenous peoples who lived here before um, white people arrived um, and or chattel slavery? Um, and how would it work? And it's one of those concepts where I think oh, there's a lot of agreement among lay people conceptually, but maybe not many much awareness or many ideas of how to actually operationalize that. Okay, so we want reparations. Okay, so we want a universal basic income. What would that look like? How would it be? And, and how do we come to some sort of, um, if not consensus, collective agreement? Yes, and that's kind of the, that's where the difficulty begins, right? Because because things like universal basic income are, are still uh, still exist within a capitalist system, and so but also within a monetary system that is you know inflationary, and and so leads us to a place where even if you decide on a, a setup, you are, you are still trapped in capitalism. We are, we are trapped in a system, right? We're trapped in capitalism, which means that someone always has to win. And so even if we go down the route of universal basic income, someone is still winning because the money is going up, not coming down. And even if we're in a position where everybody is in a place where, you know, their rent is paid, they can put food on the table, they can pay their bills. We're still operating within that existing system. And I don't think that that necessarily works. While I think it's a great step forward, while I think that, um, that it would have dramatic effects on, on productivity. <laughs> and the way that people engage with society and community at large. And, and I think it likely would encourage um, smaller businesses to be started and for people to follow their passions and for local economies to thrive as a result. I think we, we're still in a world where big corporations end up receiving the bulk of it and that one man or multiple men, because it is mostly, get richer and richer and richer and more powerful and that ultimately we're going to end up in Blade Runner, right? <laughs> Which I really like, by the way. But, yeah, that's um, a great film, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you did get me thinking um, that, you know, I think you might be right because when you look at how um, wages in the U.S. have increased recently, we've also experienced a sudden round of what we like to call inflation, which is really just yeah. a, a cutesy pie way of saying rich people like money. That yes. the, the, the equity owners of all the various companies are not lowering their prices or keeping the prices the same. They're raising their prices to match the, ex, uh, the maybe not excess, but the increased earning power of the labor force. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons. We're recording this episode in January 22, uh, 2022, where there's all sorts of exigent circumstances uh, that we don't need to go into now. But I think the larger point still stands that as people have more buying power, by and large prices get way, uh, increased. And so to your point, it kind of nets out. It's kind of self-healing, self-protecting. Yes, and not only that, we, we, live in, we live in a world such that many of the conveniences that we enjoy are provided by big corporations, mm -hmm. right? And so you, you look at Amazon as an example, it is, it is much easier for somebody to purchase some, purchase something they, they want from a service that guarantees you'll get it either the same day or the next day, no matter where you live, than to go to a local business, right? We are so entrenched in our ideas around convenience that, that it wouldn't matter we would still end up in a position where people are handing over their their maybe given cash or even well earned cash um, to to the very people that are causing the biggest issues in our world. Now, 
I've teased Jonathan for years that um, many of us in the U.S. view the British as um, a communist third world country. So I was kind of curious when you were talking about it, like, does this exist in the U.K. as well? Yes. Yes. And don't get me wrong, right? The U.K. is the welfare state, right? We are... We have National Health Service. We have benefits available to anybody for anything if they want it. Um, and that's not strictly true, right? They, they do exist. But the culture here is very much one of if you accept, if you accept support from your government in any way, shape or form outside of public health care, that you are sponging off the nation. And, um, and so that dissuades a lot of people from taking up the support that's available to them because nobody wants to be seen as stealing from the country, um, which is what it's labeled as, right? And so, yes, our experience is the same. Our, our, while we have, while we have many benefits, you know, <laughs> healthcare as one, um, which pretty much all nations except for the US have, don't they? Um, <laughs> I think I think our, our experience is very much the same. It's one of, if you were to look at our government, for instance, we have been essentially run by the Conservatives for all of time, bar the odd few moments here or there where um, our Liberal Labour um, have taken power. And so there's a there's a really insipid and prevalent um, view on productivity and being that being a part of society means working your ass off for very little in return. We still here have very low wages for key staff such as health workers and you know everywhere everywhere else um, that don't allow an individual to live or you know eat <laughs> um, and where previously and I know it was similar in the u s that an individual could support an entire family and purchase a house that absolutely isn't true now, and so circumstances while they are slightly different. They are in many ways the same. It seems a little odd to have all these services then. Like in, a, in the US, it's like, we don't have those services. We have a lot of stigma. And, you know, there there's maybe, a f you know, it's not like it was in the 30s when in the Great Depression where there were zero safety net. Now we do have safety net for crisis management, you might call it. But, um, you know, by and large, we don't have nearly the number of services that you do. We, we just have a whole lot of stigma. But it's like you have the services and the stigma. It seems kind of yes, weird. Yes, we do. Why have those well, services then? So the reason is that Labour, <clears throat> mostly, which is our liberal uh, political party, set most of the services up. And... Um, and the country, to a large degree, did believe for a long time that we should be supporting each other and therefore it makes sense for our government to support us um, through the taxes that we pay. And so that did exist for a long time. And, and certainly that was a, that was a um, kind of post-war thing that happened here. And then joining the EU and being involved in that project um, very much made us view public services as a thing that was important. Mm -hmm. And then the, the whole anti-EU rhetoric appeared and the Conservatives became just like your Republicans and only want power and money and nothing else. Um, you know, they're people who are supposed to be working for us not for themselves, but I digress. Um, and the narrative shifted. And what we're actually seeing now is a, a slow erosion of our public services and a sell-off um, and a privatization effort. And I think it's only a matter of time before the NHS is privatized. And I wouldn't be surprised if 
heading down the track that we're heading down, that we may even end up with an insurance based healthcare system like you do. Um, because conservatism has got its claws in. And whilst I can respect a lot of conservatives, and I understand their policies, and I understand the decisions they take. I feel a big but S coming. <laughs> a huge but, massive but. Um, or, or an and, maybe. Okay. And, <laughs> and there, are, there are certain actors who have bastardized what conservatism means. And, and I see that in the US as much as I see it in the UK. I follow US politics quite closely. So <laughs> I see it in the US just as much as I see it in the UK. And there's a twisted um, nationalist, populist version of conservatism taking over that, that that's sole aim is to make the value of humans less so that corporations and rich people can get richer. It seems like one response that's gained um, popular traction, especially I think among the youth in this country, and I'm curious if it's similar in the UK, is almost like a, a what I'll call a radical rest movement, where there's a movement to take time for yourself and indulge in all those things that have been stigmatized that you're not supposed to do, like take a nap or take a long walk on the beach or, you know, it, where previous generations in the U.S. thought, no, you're meant to be at work. And if you're not working, you're meant to be with your family or in church or something productive for society, um, you know, a career at the top of the list that, you know, um, country and religion and family, you know, falling shortly thereafter. There's almost this individualistic um resting movement as this um kind of radical response to hustle culture and and the and the what what used to be called the the american work ethic which was kind of based on rugged individualism and maybe what was before that kind of like the puritanical um work ethic that that we have sort of ascribed to our um uh, you know, what, something like called forefathers and stuff. Is there something analogous to that in the UK? Do you have that as well? Yeah, we do. Um, London is a is a great example. It's a there's a horrific um, approach to productivity and a desire to be seen as um, as the person who's worked the most, um, and not even necessarily the person that's produced the most, just the person that's worked the most, um, which is really sad. And I had more to say. I had um, being the operative. <laughs> it's fun me being on this podcast, right? Like just all of these times where I have something really interesting to say, and it just leaves my mind. It's great. Well, one of the <laughs> one of the um, you know the cool things that seems logical to me in that response is the rejection of and the resistance of what you might call the lie of capitalism, like you were saying that it like there's that there's some end game or that my value is based on my compensation or productivity. And, um, and if your value increases, somehow mine is diminished, you know, that kind of lie, um, which results in a, you know, the, it's a zero sum game that results in um, a, a artificial um, constraints on opportunity. Um, you know, one of the things that Jonathan and I had been talking about before the show was that like, you know, um, there are these lies out there that's like, we shouldn't be exploring space, for instance, because mm. we don't have the resources, we should spend that money here on the US. Yes. And that maybe that's a lie, because we actually have enough money to cure poverty induced hunger, if we only wanted to. We actually have, we meaning Elon Musk has enough money to, <laughs> to cure, you know, to uh, buy everybody everything. a home, yeah, <laughs> yes. you know, if we wanted to, um, we just don't want to. Um, that's a little glib, but, you know, you get the point. And so that's one of the things that I respect about this, what I'm kind of dubbing this radical rest movement, um, is that mm. they're, you know, lift, 
lifting the curtain on some of these lies that many of us don't have the capacity to question in our everyday life because we're so tired and busy and stressed yes. from this work. Yes. Yes. And, you know, like, like I said, I follow US politics. So, you know, I'm really aware of the great resignation, um, which I think is a fabulous thing, by the way. And this whole idea of um, forming unions, like there was a, it was the first ever Starbucks union formed in, I can't remember which state it was, but brilliant, right? Because somewhere along the line, we've been convinced that we don't matter. The, the bottom line of the company that we work for does, that we don't. And that that means that even if we did hold value, it's disposable. And all that matters is, is that someone is there to do the work required to make the money for the person that owns the business. And it doesn't matter who you are, it's just that someone's there. And what that means is that respect has been lost. Respect for the employee has been lost. And that's not always been the case, right? Like that was different, maybe even only 30 years ago. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really on board with the rest revolution, right? Anthropologically, and this is something that studies have shown, hunter gatherers worked actively worked at their survival no more than 20 hours per week the rest was for rest and fun and enjoyment with certainly not working 80 hours a week for their food or survival right and we are simply not designed to be working at that capacity. And if you look at any productivity studies, most people are not productive for anywhere near the amount of time they are at work. I think yeah. programmers in particular are, are in an eight or nine hour period only coding for three hours. And so this whole idea that we are trading our time for money is so outdated and so ridiculous because i mean one people can't afford to live and that's just not okay but also you know if you wanted to shift that slightly how about output for money how about outcomes for money rather than i'm going to make you work eight hours a day for this thing i know you're not working all eight hours i know you're only doing about three or four but i'm going to make you show up for that time suck the life out of you and that's the point right they're trying to keep you they're trying to keep you in the system but when you get to the end of your day you're so exhausted you can't figure out how to find a way out of it yeah and you think about the cost all that is lost from society in terms of the rites of passage it's not just that we would have yeah. the time to sit around playing video games or to um, you know, needlepoint. It's that well, we could, and, in theory, actually commune with one another. We could yes. cultivate um, healthier lifestyles. We could implement, you know, physical fitness regimens. We could um, love each other more. We could experience more togetherness. We could um, create more important art, all of that stuff. But I can hear, Jonathan, a lot of listeners, especially in the U.S., saying, that's nice. Hunter gatherers uh -huh. were cool, but they mm -hmm. didn't have penicillin. <laughs> they didn't. That's true. You know, and so is there, you know, what is the trade off? And is it is it a, is it a false trade off? Like, is it one or the other? Or is there some way to craft this utopia where we get the best of both worlds? Because some technological innovation is obviously, um, you know, evil, and others <laughs> has really positively impacted the quality and quantity of life um, yes. in the generations that followed. Yes. So there's a number of things in there. Like one, let's talk about the whole automation thing, right? AI and automation was supposed to make us work less because, because machines would do it for us, right? Our quality of life was supposed to go up. We were supposed to have three day work weeks or whatever. And it just never materialized. We just ended up with Jeff Bezos and and <laughs> and to to your point about the hunter gatherer thing and that's nice and and if you look at 
pretty much all UBI, universal basic income studies uh, and experiments. Um, there is always a percentage of people who just want to sit on their ass and play video games, right? There always is. You cannot get away from that. But that, that is true of any society and any structure. The vast majority of people do spend more time on connection, do spend more time on the community at large, do spend more time on doing the things that they love and exploring the things that they love. And what I really see now is that societally, people just need a job, which means that there are countless people doing work that doesn't fulfill them, that doesn't light them up, that could be reserved for people who actually enjoy doing that, right? But we're stuck in a system designed to keep people in jobs that they hate. There are probably countless Einsteins out there. There are countless, you know, artists and musicians that aren't putting their work out into the world and enriching our society because they can't because they don't have the opportunity to, because they can't afford to live, because the opportunities were never presented to them, because they grew up in a place where poverty was designed as a function of society. I'm clearly passionate about this. Yeah, it's like you got the Holy Ghost. I was just going to let you go on. So that, that... <laughs> <laughs> I have a strange question for you. It's a little off the wall, and, and I've just made it up. Maybe I'm plagiarizing somebody. I don't think so. I think I just made it up. Um, are people the new countries? What I mean by that is, let's take mm. an extreme example of people, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg. Are they now so powerful they are actually nations? In the US, you see that they are, we are, we are unable to hold them accountable for yeah. much of anything. They don't even pay taxes. Yeah. Much yeah. less are they held accountable for all the harm they're doing, like in our political system, et cetera, with their products yeah. and services. So in effect, not only them, are all of us now nations. We have now have these through technology, through the, through the, to Corn Zuckerberg and others, phrase, through the metaverse, um, we now have these worlds at our fingertips that we now create like gods. Are we the new nations? Uh, I don't think we are. I think corporations are. I think there are faces to corporations. Um, as an example, if you look at Apple's uh, market cap, it's just overtaken basically the UK's GDP, I think, um, which is outrageous. Um, <laughs> was it Germany? Might not be the UK yet, but almost it's close. Um, and so when, a, when, a, when an organization, when a corporation is larger than a country, of course, of course, right? How, how can you possibly hold uh, entity to account that has as much pull and influence as it does, because if it wants to change something, it just throws money at it, which we know makes the world go round our world, right? Yeah, and they're multinational. So it's like, yeah. they can just relocate at the drop of a hat. I mean, that's famously yep. been done, you know, when Microsoft moved the, to the to Ireland and um, yep. Apple's moved around. So yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing I did want to kind of back up on um, with the rest revolution is kind of talk about, we talked about some of the positives. Let's talk about some of the negatives associated with it. Mm. Um, that because it's part of a capitalist system, inevitably there is um, relentless continuous pressure to be consumed by that system. And, and what that I think can look like is um, the the bolstering of some of these cultural norms that we were talking about previously like rugged individualism meaning i deserve to rest screw everybody else i'm gonna go take a nap and i'm gonna go play this video game because i'm worth it i'm perfect as i am um or because i want to like the um um s some of those personal growth and development um theories out there where the universe kind of becomes my ATM because I want it, I will get it. I will, I will manifest it. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, um, can I think become another way to sell products, but most importantly, uh, in services, most importantly, it ignores all the people who lack the privilege to take that nap because they're so busily hus busy hustling just to survive because they stand at the intersection of race, and you know maybe neurodivergence, neurotypical 
thought and behavior, maybe, um, you know, ableist um, um, bias and, and, and bigotry, um, queer phobia, misogyny, they stand at intersections. I mean, we all stand at those intersections, but in particular, they're being harmed or they're working in industries that are now so beyond the pale, you know, big pharmaceutical industries, big agricultural industries um, that like some of the technology companies we focused on earlier um, are really um, kind of exploitation factories. Yes. I've forgotten what your question was. <laughs> so, so it's basically, I just want us to acknowledge that um, there's a there's a CD underside to this, and and in yes. any conversation we have, we have to start with the harm and then follow it up with the privilege. Like for instance, yes. I have I have such a mix of privilege and adversity in my life, and I have the privilege of being able-bodied. I have the privilege of being white. The privilege of being American and ostensibly male, neurotypical. And I have an excellent job. All of that is all of that is privilege, meaning unearned advantages. There, while I have done some work to earn my position in my company, there's plenty of other people who could have earned it and done just as good a job or not better. Yet somehow I find myself here. And so for me, morally, based on my moral code, it is incumbent on me to take as much of the, the income as I can afford to reinvest in those portions of society that don't have the same level of privilege. So, um, you know, engaging with queer owned businesses, minority owned businesses, yeah. giving to making as much as many charitable contributions as I can. And then also working on various fronts to, to kind of um, to help um, uh, take down some of the structural institutionalized bigoted systems that that keep the thumb on these people and prevent them from living what we here used to call the american dream which is long dead now at this point yeah it's uh, it's interesting because i mean one of the things i've been writing about a lot recently is 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 the in, the inherent privilege in in so many of these um uprisings especially around things like the idea of manifestation and all of those things are so inherently privileged and and the idea that you can sit around dream about something and exist pretty much only happens to 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 white people white in the straight west. people <laughs> in the west and 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 it gets it kind of gets my back up a little bit right because yeah. um i like I, I hate it i hate it and and there's an, there's an element in in um, in flaunting um, your lifestyle that you have gained through mostly privileged means. Instagram. That, yeah, that I really or TikTok, whatever, wherever, right? That that I really that I really struggle with because it is usually straight white people. Um, telling everybody that they can have whatever life they want. And that's just ridiculous in the system that we have and the setup that we have. It is unrealistic. It is um, short-sighted. It is um, insulting, actually. And it's often a con job. Like, often they're selling yes. stuff, on, you know, not always. There's a lot of people just selling the dream for, for no money. Yeah. But there's a, a lot of other people are selling services to help you, to help foster that lie. And it becomes a pyramid scheme. Yeah, no, it does. And, and I, you know, I see people, I have known some people selling those promises and, and making a great deal of money out of people who want a better life, but aren't, aren't perhaps aware that these people are doing it purely so that they can live the life they want and know that people will give them money because of who they are, because it's systemic, because, well, they're saying it, so it must be true. And at no point do these individuals uh, lift up um, minority groups or, or people with voices that matter in places that don't get attention and and that irritates me a lot yeah, um, yeah absolutely in the same way that reality television is not reality 
Instagram, TikTok, Facebook is not reality. It is not reality. And many of us lack the capacity to understand that. And the final point I wanted to make on the rest revolution, the negative sides of it is that put globally, um, people that um, have to hustle to earn a living, turn a buck and, and feed their families um, don't need a nap. Um, they need good working conditions. They need a fair wage. They need yeah. affordable health care. You know, so so we shouldn't. We, we need nuanced conversations where we don't blame the people that are being oppressed for their own oppression. And it's so easy to slip into that, especially as straight white people um, that are part of an age that are part of this technology revolution with social media. It's so easy to inadvertently or consciously become part of that problem where we continue to and maybe even increase the stigma blaming people for their lot in life, their circumstances in which they find themselves in a given moment, um, they didn't work hard enough, or they're not smart enough, or they weren't educated at the right place. However, the story goes, or maybe it's more implicit, like you were describing, with just the beautiful Instagram photos in Bali, um, trying to sucker people in to have a, a similar life. That what what by and large um, workers need is equity. Yeah, yeah. I um, I actually want to come back to something you said earlier, which was the whole idea of kind of the me first um, aspect of this, which is, you know, I deserve it and therefore I'm going to take it regardless um, in a very isolationist kind of way. And and and, and to that point, I, I, I really, really, really deeply believe that the key to overcoming all of this is actually community, that, that the key to us realising the the power perhaps that we have to to create better lives not just for ourselves but for everybody else is to to come back to recognizing the power of community and 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 actually not in a echo chamber style way that that things like facebook have created where there are singular views that unless you believe it you're not allowed in um but in a really considered um communicative honest uncomfortable um way because when we're able to do that we're able to see more of our commonalities than our differences and and we are more likely to engage in activities and behaviors that support the whole over the individual um and that's where the value bit comes in actually that's where the value bit comes in because when engaging in community when you are with your group of friends often you don't need them around because of what they do for you 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 want them around because of who they are and they may add things to your life inadvertently or purely by accident and just by the nature of who they are or what they are and that's that's actually what i mean by inherent value you it's not the doing it's the being it's the enriching of each other's lives in ways that only you can do um or you can be rather uh yeah i just wanted to add that point I think, yeah, I mean, I think togetherness in many ways is the antidote to capitalism. It's yes. much it's much more effective to sell to individuals. Um, one to one marketing is much more effective than one to many marketing. People yeah. purchase as individuals, meaning we have, you know, by and large individual bank accounts. Um, we don't have communal property other than in the family, but I'm talking about larger communities. And so what yep. capitalism first must do is separate us in order to And it does a mighty sell. fine job at it, doesn't it? Yeah. In order to effectively sell to us, it first must separate us. And it does such a great job because it's been relentlessly distilled and perfected for generations now. If it start if yep. it started in the sixteen hundreds, um fifteen, sixteen hundreds, and now we are in, in twenty twenty two, that's a long time to perfect its craft. Uh, yeah. And so it's it's we participate it we participate in it 
unwittingly and all sorts of ways that we likely aren't aware of and don't acknowledge. And it's really tough in this day and age to extract yourself from a capitalist society and actually still just survive. Whereas in previous centuries, you could do it depending on where you lived. You could go to India and live off the land or you could have a self-sustaining community in the US. There were movements around that. And in this day and age, it's really kind of, I think, difficult in the US, if not in the entire world to, you know, fully extract yourself from that system and, and be self-sufficient. Yeah, I agree. So where do we go from here? I mean, you know, how do we start to focus on the collective care that you were describing yet still, you know, I mean, people are so tired. It's like trying to get anybody to concentrate on anything in this day and age, anti-racism, anti-misogyny, anything. It's like people are so tired, so hungry, you know, working so hard, feeding their families, having multiple generations living inside their home, can barely make rent, living on wages from the 1970s. I mean, how do we start to make a change that's actually realistic and isn't just sort of like entitled, privileged, you know, jerking off? Well, I think it starts with stopping seeing each other as the enemy and and seeing the true enemy, um, which is those that seek to keep us small and malleable. And, and beyond that, I think it's very much an extension of, of exactly what I see happening in the US at the moment, which is demanding better, which is not rolling over which is coming together to demand more. And, and the reason that I talk so much about community is that when you are not isolated, it becomes much easier to know that you are supported. And the more that we isolate ourselves, the more that we are forced to isolate ourselves because the system is designed to keep us that way, the harder it becomes to rely on the community. And so actually it begins with attributing blame in the correct place and ends with choosing to engage and choosing to be a part of either your local community or some form of community beyond the one that you already have, or maybe even the one that already exists for you. Um, being a, a much more active participant in that. You know, I'm in the US, so I'm going to make it about money. I think <laughs> that if at all possible or wherever possible, we can start to set aside small portions of our income devoted to our own self care, investing in our own health and wellness um, through, you know, all sorts of means, um, whether it's reading books, joining groups, hiring coaches, mentors, teachers, um, going on retreats. You know, if we have the means as individuals to rest, we should rest and then leverage that replenishment to lift up others. Just like we can never set down privilege because it's always conferred upon us extrinsically. All we can do is leverage that privilege to lift up others. I think the same is true here. So we can literally set aside some money as we're able, even if it's pennies in a jar, to start to invest in ourselves. And then as we, as we, the tide rises, as our replenishment gains, we can start to direct that money or, or develop, you know, new streams of savings, however small, that we then invest in other um, minority owned companies, for instance, so that we are, or, or charitable do donations, so that we're, again, the rising tide where we are putting the blame where it truly resides, which is in the large corporations, especially the multinational corporations, and then redirecting those hard-won resources to the small individual businesses, particularly run and operated and owned by people who have experienced various forms of oppression. That's something small that we can all do over time. I'm not diminishing how hard it might be, especially in this day and age at 1970s wages to start to cultivate a prudent reserve, um, to start to cultivate a savings. But even if it's pennies in the jar, 
um, I think we can start to stoke our awareness to read books for free or to purchase books, to purchase courses or participate for free in community programs to educate ourselves and then use all that we gain, to leverage all that we gain to redirect that to, to lift up others. I think that is something that almost everyone can do in some way if we were to get creative and, and think about truly all that we have um, you know, at, at our hands and fingertips. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think for those that really struggle with the monetary thing, and I know there are many, um, you know, one of the key reasons that I referenced community so much is that so much of what you need doesn't require money. Um, when you have a community that supports you, um, I know that because I experience it. And, and I think that's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, the, the best things in life really are free and unpurchasable <laughs> even. And, yes. Um, yes. you know, they, they cannot be bought and we cannot be bought and sold much as capitalism lies to us and tells us we can. Um, we, we actually, none of us can truly be bought, bought and sold. No. There's some piece of us at the very least that remains untouched. And by investing in that piece and nurturing in it, it will grow. And over yes. time, we can we can start to shine that light with the rest of the world and and um, lift each other up in a way that doesn't that isn't at the beck and call of these public held multinational corporations. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a good place to leave it. I really enjoyed this conversation today. I learned a lot. This is not something that I've necessarily um, studied and and so i was really excited to talk about it and, and i and i really learned a lot by talking with you yeah absolutely me too and i think i think you know we 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 admit that we are not the source of information all truth on this matter and so we'd love to engage with you listeners on this um leave us comments let us know what you think because this is not an echo chamber <laughs> Amen to that. Well, you have been listening to Not Going Quietly. We're so glad you joined us on this episode as we talked about knowing your intrinsic value and worth. I think it was a really enlightening topic, a really important topic, and I can't wait to hear your comments, as Jonathan said, and, and I hope that you share this with the world. Um, I'm Britt East, my co-host, Jonathan Bill. Until next time, thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Not Going Quietly with co-hosts Jonathan Beal and Britt East. Thanks so much for joining us on this wild ride as we explore ways to help everyone leap into life with a greater sense of clarity, passion, purpose, and joy. Check out our show notes for links, additional information, and episodes located on your favorite podcast platform.